let me uh, introduce the first uh, discussant, Dr. David Pellet here, uh, Professor of Nutrition Policy from uh, Cornell University Division of Nutritional Sciences. Uh, David and I go back almost 25, 30 years when I took over from David as a nutrition policy advisor in Malawi uh, from Cornell. Um, and uh, I gained a lot from learning from uh, him on the institutional issues uh, in Malawi. David. Um, and I'll divide my comments, which have to be very brief, five or six minutes, uh, into some strengths uh, and what I really like about this body of work, as well as some concerns and some suggestions. Um, the strengths are um, what we have here is a, a, very, a relatively simple, very comprehensible, consolidated framework that brings together what is actually a very confusing and disparate set of literatures. I know when I entered this field, when I switched from epidemiology to policy about 15 years ago, it was like walking in the wilderness. So congratulations to the team for bringing some coherence to, the, to these bodies of literature. And I think this is helpful for future researchers as well as practitioners. I also think the design is very well conceived. Uh, the three major categories of, of context, of determinants that are subject to human agency uh, and, and, and of uh, the stages of the policy process are well recognized in these literatures. So that's a very firm foundation for this model. Um, one side note here is that it would be good, I think, to be more transparent in the paper which I reviewed about the sources that were used to identify the constructs that are in the various components of the model. Maybe even making a matrix showing um, out of the papers or, 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 or manuscripts that were reviewed which of these constructs came from which of the papers. I've seen other work in the implementation science literature that does this and it's much more transparent and rigorous. Um, Another comment here is there are some fuzzy boundaries, I think, in, uh, between the categories, both between the determinants in the gray center and the contextual factors in the outer ring, um, such that some things belong in both places. Uh, and some of the factors, in fact, uh, belong in different slices of the, uh, of the determinant, um, de de determinant category. So things like incentives and legal frameworks uh, and, and research reports and publications can be instrumental at multiple stages in the policy process, not just at an agenda, agenda setting or adoption, for instance. I, what I also like about the paper, which wasn't shown here, uh, the, the, the inner circle has the uh, 16 determinants numbered, and the paper converts these into hypotheses, statements, claims that can be the, ten, tested against the empirical uh, experience in the countries that you've heard about. That's a very nice piece that often in this body of literature, we don't see that kind of, of clear thinking and, and, and hypothesis testing. I do think, again, as a side note here, we still have some measurement problems uh, in some of, um, some of the, the evidence that needed to test those hypotheses. It's kind of squishy. Uh, and, and propitious timing was mentioned in one of the presentations. That's one example, but I think there are many others. So we should actually turn that into a research topic is to find out, more, find out more rigorous ways to measure some of these constructs for future work. Switching over to some of the concerns and suggestions, the paper itself is a, is a bit schizophrenic about whether this is, um, this is a model uh, that, that is trying to identify key determinants and drivers that are likely to be important in all or most cases, and that's an extreme characterization, or is it a contingent and contextual model, such as this is the range of factors that might be important, that if you're a practitioner, you should pay attention to, or if you're a researcher, you should pay attention to, but not all of them may be equally important in all cases. So the analogy here, for those of you who are familiar with the UNICEF conceptual framework, is that food, health, and care are the three essential underlying causes of malnutrition. Um, none of them is sufficient by, the, by itself. Um, but all of them together provide good nutrition, food, health, and care. So in some contexts, one or another or two or three um, are more important than others. I also think there's an opportunity here um, uh, to, to present this model as a framework that can help improve the standardization of reporting of empirical work in this area, with two minutes left. Um, uh, because right now, people approach a given policy situation for research purposes with diverse frameworks, diverse methods, and they're going to look at some factors but totally ignore others. Well, this represents a template that perhaps all researchers should give a fair consideration to in, before they design their study. <clears throat> 
and so it would be very helpful to promote this as a tool that would standardize research in this area so that we can have, a, we can have some good comparative work over time and really build a body of science around this. Um, very quickly, there, I think there are a few elements that are missing or underdeveloped uh, in, in, the, in the model or there's some in, in, inaccurate inferences or claims made. Um, one relates to cohesion, consensus, and conflict. It's really not in the model, but Jeremy, Schiffman, Jeremy Schiffman's work clearly identified that as, as a major important thing at the agenda setting stage. And in our work in the mainstreaming nutrition, uh, it, within the nutrition policy community, uh, disagreements and con conflict seem to abound in many, many countries and, and get in the way of progress. Um, so it would be useful to bring that on board. Related to that, a claim was made that, that in the case study of, of Zambia, at least, um, RCT evidence, randomized controlled trial evidence that, that we have access to in nutrition, uh, provides clear answers and clear consensus as to what needs to be done. But we don't have that on the, in the subsidy side. Um, I would take issue with that. Um, uh, the, the RCTs can establish efficacy for something, but, but that's just the first step uh, in, in perhaps identifying a potential solution to a problem. But you still have to choose between supplementation or fortification or food-based approaches. And then there's a whole suite of, of, um, of decisions to be made about how to implement it, who's going to take leadership, who's going to have different roles and responsibilities, and so on. And those all can become the basis for conflict and disagreement. I think with the time available, I'll stop there. Very nice piece of work. Thank you.